Hello, welcome to my latest video. If you want to know more about me or my life in the music industry, on the edge of the music industry, well, watch this video because I think you're in for a few surprises. This is going to be slightly different to the last few videos in that I'm going to talk about the music business and my role inside it or not, as the case may be. First of all, let's think about what the music business is. Basically comes in two parts. One is recording and one is live. I was much more involved in the live side of the music industry, well, on the edges of of the live side of the music industry for nearly 48 years now. When you go watch a live band or an artist playing, the person who puts on that, that show, might have been me, um, or more likely somebody in the real music industry. Back when I started in 1972, it was much more clear cut. The British music industry consisted of Again, you had your major record labels like EMI and whoever else it was. I can't, I can't remember back then. Oh, EMI, um, Decca, people like that. And there were really no independent labels then. And then you had your live music side, which normally was impresarios. You would have somebody like Tito Burns, I can remember, was one of them, who used to own an agency and he used to manage acts and he used to put on shows. So if you went to see a show at, say, Margate Winter Gardens back in 70, whatever, it would probably be um, something like that. It, it was a lot more common then for the venue to be run by a management who would buy an act from an agent. Now it seems to be that normally there are independent, well, independent promoters who put on shows. Most of them actually aren't that independent now because now the music industry the live side of it is tends to be dominated by major corporations back when i was managing acts and putting on bands back in the 70s and 80s and 90s in the 1970s 1980s 1990s of course that was somebody like me could not really manage a band that went on to be big because i would take the band to a record label and they go, oh yeah, quite interesting. But then the record label would more than likely go to the band behind my back and say, look, you don't want him, you want blah, blah, blah. He's a big successful manager. He'll be the best ma manager because he knows everybody. And so I would get sidelined. The same went for being a an agent. If you did your job really well and you made a band famous, then you could say bye bye to that band. Well, good, goodbye. 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 Enjoy yourself. Bye. Goodbye. 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 I've been in this game for, what I say, 48 years nearly, and I can't think of one instance where a band has that I have helped to be famous, and there have been lots of them, have then come back and helped me by doing a show because even Chaz and Dave. Back in, well, back when I was at the 100 Club, which is about 2008, something like that, I started to put on Chaz and Dave. And I got to know them well. They'd basically been very famous and then, and so when I met them, they were doing nights at the 100 Club on a Sunday night for, for actually someone else and they'd be doing working men's clubs and they'd, they'd be doing smaller things that, than they ought to have been doing. So, so I helped them a bit. Um, they they want to go on Glastonbury, so I helped them go on Glastonbury. No matter what you read, it was me who got them onto Glastonbury by, by, by persuading Paul Charles, who's a friend of mine, who was an author when I published books, who I've known for years, put them on at the acoustic stage at Glastonbury and they became the um, instant hit. And from then, they went on to greater things, like we were doing Christmas Beano's at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, a large venue, things like that. So I helped them a lot, but then due to various circumstances, substance things personally happened in their lives, and let's not go into that. But when they came back to doing live shows, you'd think that they would go to the person who helped them 
No, 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 not a thing. That their new agent, basically a guy who's like a variety agent, um, said, you don't want to be with him, you want to be playing at the O2. And so, bye bye Jim again. I have been on the edge of the music world for 48 years, partly because when you get to that stage, you are going to get knocked back. And partly because after a few times like this, you start to think, what the hell, I'll just work with people who are on the way down, really, rather than on the way up. And so you tend to deal with the artist yourself. You treat them fairly. Well, I created a bit of a niche for myself when I was started to do shows again at the 100 Club after I came back into live music. I did a niche of classic acts from, from earlier, not so much punk to be honest because other people were were doing that but bring on acts say from the 60s and 70s who are very good let's say and have a certain crowd and then trying to persuade that that crowd to then come and watch them and then come back the next week to watch watch somebody else that was always the hard thing because i thought that if you had somebody who went to see for example wilco johnson who used to be the guitarist in dr feelgood who basically wrote most of their famous songs back in the 1970s and obviously played lead, um, you would think that somebody who went to watch Wilco Johnson would then go and see Dr. Feelgood. Well, basically, the, um, the same band now, after lots of lineup changes, playing much of these same songs. But you'd be wrong. Back when I was doing the 100 Club shows, there were people who went to see Dr. Feelgood who would never go and see Wilco Johnson, even though it's the same music, the same stuff, and vice versa. So that's a bit weird. You had to sell the same show over and over. There were a handful of people, probably two or three hundred, who did come regularly to watch um, all the bands, or most of the bands that I stuck on, hoping to be entertained by somebody they perhaps were not that clued in about. And then when I was booted out of the Hunter Club, for reasons we will probably go into in a later video, I went to the borderline, which didn't have the same historical cachet. So it's a little bit harder, but I made that work and that was great. And then slowly it began to peter out. I lost interest in the same thing over and over again. And then the borderline closed. So there we go, here we are now. There's lots more things along the way. There's the Rhythm Festival, which I've not really entered into. That I was always on the edge of the music industry because, ironically, to be part of the music industry, you can't be an entrepreneur like a single person who's doing their own thing, like forming their own agency or management company or promoting shows. You have to go and work for one of the big promotion companies like... Um, now you've got Live Nation, you've got um, all sorts of things now. I can't remember what, what they're all called to be honest here because I just lost interest in it all. But you've got to really go and work for, for them. Then you become part of this li little club. And then there's about, um, oh, what's that, about two or three hundred people who basically mix. They're the agents, the people who work for the agencies, the people who work for the promotions companies who then go off to work for something else, who then form another thing. But they're always in the same little clique. I was never part of that, to be honest, here, partly because I couldn't be bothered. But it is possible to integrate into that because a friend of mine, who is also a promoter, made a point of getting himself involved in all that and it seems to have worked. Now he's part of all that and he gets to do the big shows at this and... Another way in is if you have an act that the... or well, accidentally actually, or because I tend to specialise in getting people in from the States who I liked or whatever, who didn't really have a, a way in through the recognised big music industry, whether it's, um, sorry, my phone went, shall I see who it is? Oh, just somebody saying, oh, well, lunchtime now, there you go. So that was interesting, wasn't it? But anyway, let's take it about that, and let's go back to this. Um, so you, so for example, I did a show um, probably about 10 years ago now, with a band from the States who basically done bought the Genesis. I actually think it could be from Canada. And they bought the Genesis live show costumes and props. And they were going around the world doing this exact same album 
and they change the albums occasionally. And so I, I can't remember the name of the band, something like Music Box or something. And so I was never into Genesis or into them particularly, or into this sort of thing. But I was going to do it and um, I was persuaded to take it to somebody who worked for a big live music promoter. And I got to see behind the scenes about how it works in that thing. And it is to totally different. When I was doing shows, you would basically have all your costs. You'd have your high revenue, you'd pay the band, you do this, do 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 And then you take, and then I just, I tended to pay bands flat fees against door centres, which means that the more people in, the more that they earned. These sort of shows, you tend to take the costs of the show off the door takings before you start paying the band extra. So the band are getting a fee, plus they're getting extras. And one of the big, I'm not saying this happened in this case, but one of the big things the big companies do, which is, I think, quite well known, I mean, why they, get, they are able to do it, I don't know, but they tend to inflate what things cost. And, and they can because they're also involved with owning the venue and owning the PA company and things like that. So, for example, say the Hammersmith Apollo back then might charge £10,000 to hire it for one night. Um, that's great. So, so you put down on, on your costs £10,000 and that's everybody knows that's what it cost is, right? But because the um, company had a deal with the venue or maybe owned it, they would then get a some sort of fee or some sort of discount which would not go into the um, into the expenses of that show. So which which again you see they can get around that by saying things like oh over a certain period of time we'll let you have 10% off that's how they make their money they put the cost the costs are not the actual costs so they make a bit more out of it like that. back in the live promotion scene one of the big things that happened was back in the 1990s I think it was when a company called SJM started they because prior to that all the normal deals were that the band would get 75% or something after costs and the fee and all that. And then SJM came along in the 1990s and said, no, we'll pay you 90% of the fee. Or we will or give like 90% or 85% or 99% or whatever of the take. But they don't because they don't get all of it. So anyway, that's how it works. Hope that wasn't too boring and let's pause there. Well, thanks for watching that. That's part one, I think. There'll be more on the same kind of thing in the next few days and weeks and months and years and decades, what well, we hope. Who knows what fate has in store for us, eh? Please like this if you liked it. If you didn't like it, then, well, you don't have to do anything, really. But if you did like it, and I hope you did, then subscribe to my channel. Please like it, and also let me know down below by adding a comment what you thought or what you think I could do in the future that would be interesting or exciting or good that you'd like to see and what you don't want me to do. Stuttering is maybe not on the um, agenda because I will probably still, still, still stutter. You see what I mean? Right, so thank you for watching and see you next time.